Good morning. morning. And welcome to the Beverly Presbyterian Church on this 20th day of June, the year of our Lord, uh, 2021. It's the fourth Sunday after Pentecost and also Father's Day in this year. Special word of uh, thanks and congratulations to all fathers here present this morning. Anyway, also with us this morning is um, Justin Hartz sitting at our organ council and he will offer us our opening volunteer prelude called The Opening Voluntary by Caleb Simper. Will you join me responsibly in our call to worship? Our help is in the name of the Lord. The psalmist declares that the Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. God rules the world with righteousness and demands justice of the nations. grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is selection number 17, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above, number 17, please.
some people, but indeed God is our friend. Unfortunately, we have not always been so friendly towards God and even towards one another. Therefore, as individuals and as a congregation, let's join together in our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Lord of hosts, we confess that we are weak, unable on our own to defeat the enemies of our souls. We give in to our fears, and we live in their darkness, rather than living by faith in your promises of mercy and justice. Even as you delivered your people of old from their enemies by the hand of David, your anointed servant, so deliver us, we pray, from all evil through the son of David, your anointed one and our sovereign Jesus of Nazareth. By the same Spirit that strengthened them both to believe and to act according to your promises, strengthen us also to serve you faithfully, that we may be victorious over all the forces of darkness within us and around us, to the praise of your glory and grace. Amen. God has listened to us. In spite of all we have done or not done, God still accepts us. This is the day of salvation, when brokenness is mended, problems are seen in a new light, and fierce winds are stilled. God does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God's affection for us is limited only by our failure to respond. Accept the gift of God's love, for it is everything we need. Believe these words, this good news and go forth to serve our Lord in peace. Indeed, that we might serve him as God desires, he himself has given us two rules by which we should live our lives. When he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This he said is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. In these two rules are summarized all the law and the prophets. The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 17, um, various verses therein. It's the familiar story of David and his uh, battle with Goliath. Hear these words. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting like a man from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, 
because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. And then from verse 35. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five, food, five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. The second lesson this morning is taken from Mark chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. Hear these words. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still! Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Here ends the readings. May God open our hearts and minds to the message. This time, Joe's going to favor us with another Backyard Bible. Good morning. Welcome to Backyard Bible. When Jesus was in his ministry, the little children came up to him one time and the disciples tried to shoo them away and Jesus said bring the children to me because he understood that the faith of a child was based purely on their experience of the love of God they didn't have to have miracles or signs to show them that God existed and that he was in their lives little children express that all the time and as adults sometimes we suppress that feeling just like the disciples did. We shouldn't do that. So today, I want to bring to you the expression of faith that one of our young people have. So, 
without further ado, here it is. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice, sunny garden, any garden. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, sunny garden. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Gage, for that. That was wonderful. And it demonstrates your love for God and Jesus. The only thing missing was the mic drop at the end as he walked off. So if you have a young person that's expressing their faith in one of their talents and want us to demonstrate that here and don't have a problem with them being online, please feel free to send it to us and perhaps we'll be able to use it in a future Backyard Bible. But I want to thank Gage for his faithfulness, and I hope that we can all uh, approach the kingdom of God with the faith of a child. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for children and their unabiding love and faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's Backyard Bible. Justin will now be verse with Allegretto by Charles Dooner. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts, the meditations, and the reflections of this your congregation find acceptance and pleasure in your sight with our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. The bathtub was purportedly invented in 1850. 25 years later, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, which prompted one wit to quip, just think, you could have sat in a bathtub for 25 years without the phone ringing. It never seems to fail, does it? Just when you think you can enjoy some peace and quiet, the phone rings, the baby cries. The air conditioning fails. You lose the signal to your favorite music station. Or your boss calls you into the office. Peace is a precious commodity. And it's also an elusive commodity. The great Italian Renaissance poet Dante Alighieri was exiled from his home in Florence, Italy. Depressed by this cruel turn of fate, he resolved to walk from Italy to Paris, where he could study philosophy in an effort to find some clue as to the meaning of life. In his travels, Dante found himself a weary pilgrim, forced to knock at the door of the Santa Croce Monastery to find refuge from the night. 
A surly brother within was finally aroused. He came to the door, flung it open, and in a gruff voice asked, What do you want? Dante responded with a single word, Peace. The prolific English writer H.G. Wells was one of the more creative men of the early 20th century. Also an atheist, in his autobiography, Wells said, I cannot adjust my life to secure any fruitful peace. Here I am at 65, still seeking for peace. Dignified peace is just a hopeless dream, unquote. It is certainly a word that is a stranger to many people today. The fast-paced life that many of us lead promise provides us with an unprecedented measure of material possessions, yet it does not provide us with peace. Stress is our constant companion. Anxiety haunts our dreams. What if we should be downsized out of a job? What if our next project is a failure? With COVID-19 prevalent, what if I were to get ill for a prolonged period of time? Or what if I were even to die? Finding peace, at least a peaceful setting, has become a preoccupation of our day and age. In that, many of us can relate to Jesus. Chapter 4 of Mark's Gospel details the busy and exhausting day that Jesus had had. He had been teaching along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd gathered around became so large that Jesus was compelled to get into a boat and preach in it a short distance from the shore. He introduced people to the kingdom of God through parables about varying soils, a lamp, seed sprouting no one knows how, and a mustard seed. As the sun set behind him, Jesus directed his disciples to set sail for the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is a distance of around eight miles. Now, considering that there were four fishermen on the boat, Jesus laid back and let the boat and waves just rock him to sleep while they sailed along. But the Sea of Galilee is not always calm, tranquil. Geologically, the sea is located 700 feet below sea level, some 40 miles to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. Clouds forming over the Mediterranean are blown by the prevailing westerly breezes over rising elevations, including Mount Carmel. They then descend dramatically and swirl around the surface of the Sea of Galilee, which is rather like the bottom of a bowl with the surrounding mountains. The descending air currents create no little turbulence, often with little or no warning. The boat transporting Jesus and the disciples became engulfed in one of these squalls as they were attempting to cross the lake. The disciples, experienced seamen as some of them were, recognized their danger, their peril. The waves were beating the boat, and they were taking on water. Their boat and its passengers could go down. Panic was swamping over the disciples. And yet Jesus kept on sleeping on the stern of the boat, seemingly oblivious to the turbulence swirling all around him. He showed no awareness of the peril. In fact, in desperation, it was the disciples who roused Jesus. Teacher, they cried, don't you care if we drown? The disciples were clearly distressed. Roused and aroused. Jesus, for his part, directs a rebuke to the wind and waves. Peace, be still, he commands. And just as suddenly as the wind and waves had stirred things up, now the surface of the waters became calm. A great calm, as Mark describes it. But it was an eerie calm. Who is this guy? disciples wondered, that even the wind and the sea obey him. No doubt the disciples were recalling a myth associated with the words of creation in Genesis 1. 
According to this myth, the original act of creation involved God in a desperate but ultimately victorious contest with the forces of chaos and evil, which were identified with, or at any rate located in, the waters of the sea. As God had prevailed over these forces to bring order to the chaos in Genesis 1, so Jesus brought order to the chaotic waters and storm which he and the disciples were encountering on the Sea of Galilee. While the disciples had been not unjustifiably terrified in the storm, so now they were faced with a new sort of terror. The realization that resident within this man, Jesus, whom they had chosen to follow, were powers equal to those of God himself. The disciples were filled with awe. Indeed, this might be described as an experience which was awful. While the disciples were pleased that they had been privileged to be part of such an event, on the other hand, they were wondering what they were dealing with here. This Jesus was awesome, no doubt about it. But what were the disciples to make and take from this experience? What were they supposed to learn? What did Mark intend by including this incident within his gospel? Obviously, Peter, the career fisherman, was amongst those in the boat that night as they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. Though Peter was regularly a man given to bravado, in this instance, Peter makes no grandiose claims, but the experience left its imprint on his mind and heart. Years later, in fact, decades later, to have, Peter is renowned to have ventured to Rome, where his life was ended by his being crucified, at least according to tradition, upside down, because he did not feel worthy to be crucified to die in the same manner as his Lord. One of the individuals believed to have been part of that early church in Rome was Mark, the one who penned this gospel. Mark had heard the report of this incident from Peter, and Peter would likely summon the event whenever things were not going well for the early church, when the church was encountering turbulence, in fact, life-threatening turbulence. The image of a boat with a mast in the shape of a cross was early used in the church as an image for it. As Jesus had stilled the waves in the Sea of Galilee when Peter and the disciples were crossing by boat to the other side, so in the early church it was imagined that Christ would quiet and render calm the turbulence and disturbances that the early Christian church was facing. As Jesus had brought calm in the midst of that storm during the dark night on the sea, so Jesus could be counted on again to bring peace and great calm amidst the storms and challenges which the early church was enduring. The awesome Lord could be counted on to be tranquilly present yet again. No doubt this event inspired the early church to steer ahead, even in the midst of all the trials and tribulation which they were facing. As Jesus had both chastised and encouraged his disciples for their lack and want of faith in God, so Peter and others in those early Christian communities were chastened and encouraged, especially during the days of the Emperor Nero and his purchase of the early Christians, which in fact may have been one of the occasions in which Peter himself was executed. There were storms which they would pass through. But the operative word is through. They would pass through the storms with the Lord in their hearts and at their side. The critical issue was where they would end up when they had passed through. As one commentator expressed it, we can put up with a lot as long as we know that we're going to get through. At times, it may well be the case that the early church couldn't imagine where it would end up. Still, they remained confident that the Lord would be with them, both in the calm and in the storms. Jesus would help to guide, and as an old hymn says, he would pilot them. Jesus would lead them forward and into a better tomorrow. 
That isn't simply blind faith. It wasn't simply positive thinking or possibility thinking. This was faith built upon experience of and with the risen Christ. Peter had been blessed to have known Jesus during his earthly ministry and life. That experience had enriched him and it continued to exercise a profound influence upon him as he ventured forth and encouraged others to do so along with him. I suppose there will always be a certain amount of bravado which characterized this as most people imagined, this burly fisherman. But Peter's personality seems to have been tempered rather like steel, but strengthened and toughened through his life encounters and especially those encounters which he had enjoyed with the Lord Jesus. And through Peter and the other apostles who had been involved in similar experiences with the Lord, braving and prevailing against the tempests and trials of life, these individuals exuded a confidence, a trust, a faith in the Lord which proved contagious. Recall, too, our Old Testament lesson this morning when David, only a youth, took on and defeated the giant Goliath and the Philistines, the arch enemies of Israel. Others contracted faith through David and the apostles of Christ Jesus, and they led the church forward until it became one of the, the, if not the most, influential organization and power on the face of this earth. And in that capacity, it accomplished and continues to accomplish great good for God and his son, our Lord Christ Jesus. God continues to work great good through the body of Christ, through the church. Now that doesn't in any sense suggest that the church is going to go unchallenged as it forges ahead into the future. And likewise for local congregations, there is no hint from Jesus that the churches who follow in his footsteps are not going to be disturbed and or challenged, even whipped about by the winds of time as it sets sail across the seas of our day and age. This Beverly Presbyterian Church has experienced and continues to experience just those sorts of challenges. Now, we might expect to be able to hunker down in the church and not be affected and confronted by the winds and turmoil of this day and age, but that's just not going to happen, if indeed it ever has. The church, at its best, will continue to be a place where the hearts and minds of believers are stimulated, challenged, uplifted, changed for the better. Now, I can use myself as an example of that. I was in eighth grade back in rural Iowa when I felt by, called by God to become a minister. But let me assure you that under no circumstances did I imagine that during my life and tenure as a minister of word and sacrament that I would serve congregations in which the plurality, if not the majority, of the fellowship would be made up of as an old song that I learned in Sunday school expresses it, red and yellow, black and white. Nor did I imagine that I would serve in foreign lands as a minister. Yet at times, that's where God has placed me. And I've been enriched in each and every single one of my charges. Now, hopefully it can be said that I also have proven to be a blessing in each of those charges. The challenges have always been there, and so have the blessings and the Spirit of God. God has cared for and supported me no matter where I have been. And the same, I believe, is true of this Beverly Presbyterian Church. This congregation continues to be involved in effective service for our Lord and Savior. And that hasn't necessarily been easy. Sometimes may have been better than others, but it has never been without challenge and sometimes even no little turbulence. 
but Christ goes with us. And Christ helps to calm us and reassure us as we pass through those storms. I'd be missed too if I did not on this particular Sunday recognize one party who has manifested for me, like Jesus, a calming presence in the times of storm. Now I know I can always turn to God in times of trial, but I also know that in that I follow a man who did that before me, my father. I recall one summer morning, I think it was actually a Sunday, Sunday morning, when my father went out to the hog house to take care of the hogs. He had probably around 100 hogs ready for market, or almost ready for market. He had taken care of the sows until they farrowed, and taken care of the piglets until they were weaned, and then through the stages of their upbringing to the point where they were now ready for market. But that morning when he walked to the hog lot, he noticed that the hogs were sick and in distress. And in fact, four had already died. Over the next few weeks, he would pull hog after hog out of that lot because they were dying. From what the veterinarian discovered was cholera. And yet through it all, my dad continued to pray, giving thanks before each and every single meal we would share as a family, continuing to teach Sunday school, and serve as superintendent where he often led our church in prayer. Dad remained calm and faithful during those trying, challenging days and seasons. To this day, I think I can remain somewhat calm during many of the trials of life because of what my father taught me and moreover, what he personally demonstrated for me. He was always a calming presence and force in my life, rather than like Jesus was in that boat crossing the Sea of Galilee. I can only hope and pray that all of you have enjoyed such a similar experience and are doing your part to facilitate that sort of fatherhood from yourself, from your husband, and from others. To be sure, these are challenging times. I cannot promise you a rosy future, but I can tell you this. We don't navigate these times on our own. Jesus cares. He cares for us, and he cares enough to walk with us unto all our tomorrows. This Beverly Presbyterian Church may be buffeted by storms, but it will always enjoy the peace and presence of Christ Jesus to help it weather and pass through the storms. Let us pray. Simple stories, God. A story of a youth taking on a giant. A story of a man sailing across turbulent waters with his disciples. And in them we draw inspiration, O oh God. For they remain calm in the midst of the storm. They acted to make the world better, more peaceful, more like you intended it to be even from Genesis 1. So, God, we pray for that spirit, and we pray once again for that special peace, that peace of Christ which surpasses understanding. 
Grant us your grace, O oh God, and your peace, for we pray it in Jesus' name. time I think Pat will uh, suffer our morning's announcements. walk gets longer every week. <laughs> um, happy Father's Day to those fathers who are with us. Hope you have a lovely day. Um, we're going to start with our stewardship report, which is not too great. Um, what can I say? Do your best. We're really struggling here. But um, we struggled in the past, and we made our way through, and I'm sure God is leading us in that way. Um, next, we have our, uh, our prayer list. I spoke to Shirley last night, and she said that Chalky is going back to work this week. Uh, he's going to do light duty, but he is feeling better and he will be requiring uh, more surgery in the future. But um, <clears throat> he's getting his strength back and he's feeling better. So that's good news. And I haven't heard anything about Barbara Judd recently. Has anyone had any updates on Barbara? I know she's been having struggling with a lot of uh, health issues. Well, keep her in your prayers and also Barbara Herman, she was here two weeks ago, I guess it was, right? And, um, and our wonderful Joe Reed in the back, who had had a bit of a tumble a couple weeks ago, and he hurt his back. So um, keep him in your prayers also. Um, and Gary Christopher. Gary Christopher is really, he's back in the hospital, and his infection has um, increased. So uh, he really, really needs our prayers. He had gone to rehab, and I think that only lasted a day or two, and um, they had to put him back in the hospital because the infection is going up his leg. So uh, he really needs our prayers, and also Nancy because she's uh, guiding him. She's right next to him all the time, taking care of him. So, um, and I also wanted to mention Mike, who is with us today. Keep him in your prayers also. He had a procedure a couple weeks ago, which was not uh, an easy thing, and it certainly was necessary, but he seems to be doing very, very well. He's looking good there. <laughs> so uh, keep him in your prayers. And is there anyone else that I should be adding to this list? Oh my, um, a friend of, a neighbor of Tracy's, for those who are on the streaming, uh, was in a car accident and has, they have both broken their legs, so um, keep them in your prayers also. Um, okay, oh, next, uh, all right, let's do the flower dedications. We have from Pat Kelly uh, for her mother, Marjorie Staples and honoring their anniversary, Joy and Mike McWilliams. Happy anniversary. How many years? Three years. Three years. All right. Uh, and we also have the food pantry on uh, Tuesday of this week. No, tomorrow. Monday. Tomorrow. Yeah, why does it say Tuesday? Monday from three to five. Okay, three to five. 
And that is outside, they don't even come in the church, they just drive around the, in the driveway there. And um, I think I, noted, I mentioned that last month we were able to put some tables out there and put some uh, donations of clothing and odds and ends that people were not using anymore and they were donating. So I don't know if they're planning on doing that this, this month, but we are constantly trying to serve in this, in this mission because this is one mission that we have kept alive. And I, as I'm going to talk to you about next week, um, for our annual meeting, uh, we have missions in place that we should be really working at. And this food pantry is, has been our mission since wonderful Julie <laughs> got us started on this. Uh, and, and it's doing very well, and we keep coming up with different ways and different things to do. But there are also other missions that we can be doing in this area and in this, in this uh, community. And this is something that we have to think about. But we need people. It doesn't happen without people. So I also have one other thing before I go into this annual meeting. Um, I had a brainstorm. I have one of them in a while. <laughs> and I was thinking of having a get together in July if it seems like people are getting more comfortable. And what I was thinking of is, uh, I think a lot of people have hobbies and things that they do at home that we don't even know about. And this kind of makes the person. So I think it would be really interesting if we could bring our hobbies and our interests to church and let people know what you're doing. For instance, I do counted cross stitch. So I plan to bring some, some of the uh, pieces that I have done. And you can tell people how it's done. You can show them the result. Um, and it, it allows you to become more familiar with that person, the other side of that person. You only see the church person. So uh, we're going to try this out and see how it goes. And it's going to be called pie in the sky because we're having pie for dessert, pie and coffee. So if you would like to bring a pie for dessert, that would be wonderful. I'll give you more information when I get it all together, but that was my brainstorm. So uh, next week after church, immediately following the service, we have our uh, annual con congregational meeting. and. Um, Please try to be here and stay because we do have a couple things that kind of got pushed aside and changed around because of the pandemic and we need to straighten that out and get it ready for 2022. So um, we need the congregation's input on this and we also need your votes. So uh, please come next week and um, I'll be looking forward to it. Is there anything I've forgotten? Oh, haircut. Oh, July 18th, sorry. We do need a... July 18th. July 18th, okay. The next, the next haircut day will be July 18th. And you can call Dawn or Karen at the numbers up on the screen to make your appointment. And all donations from that go to the balancing of the budget which we all know we need. So I will stop talking now and leave you. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a pleasant aroma around this uh, microphone right now. <laughs> and there should be that kind of pleasant aroma whenever Christians are around. One of the ways in which we make the world a sweeter and better place is by giving and sharing of ourselves, especially through our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let's make the world a better place.
our need. We give in order that others in even greater need might not be forgotten. We are grateful for the trust you place in us. We give in order that others might respond to that good news of your love. We are hearing the word Jesus spoke in the midst of the storm. Peace, be still. With fresh calm and comments, we give ourselves that others might live. Thank you, God, for your steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us join together in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Father's Day in the year 2021, we give you thanks for our earthly fathers and especially for the many ways in which they have mirrored your love to us. God, it's not easy being a father, being a parent, but we thank you for those who do their best, their utmost, in that effort. Bless all fathers this day, O oh God. May they know that peace, which is so elusive here on this earth. Indeed, O oh Father, with Christ we pray for that perfect peace which surpasses our human understanding. We pray for those who are suffering with COVID. We pray for those who minister those who are suffering from it. And we pray for all of us as we fear this disease, knowing that throughout creation and time eternal, you have fought back against the powers of darkness and death. And yet once again, O oh God, you are fighting against those powers of darkness and death. We thank you for the doctors and the physicians and the nurses who help us in that fight, O oh God. Bless them, lift them up, help them not only to be instruments of peace, but to know that peace. We pray too, O oh God, for those in our midst who suffer from other illnesses, not COVID. For Chalky, we give you thanks for restoring health. We pray your blessing upon him as he returns to work. We pray for Barbara Judd, Barbara Herman, for Mike, for Leanna, and a neighbor involved in an accident. We pray for healing for Gary Christopher and continued healing for Joe Reed. And we pray too, O oh God, for those that come to mind who have not been mentioned here. Grant health and wholeness to us one and all. Grant us peace, we pray. That peace of Christ, which calms the storms and enables us to become instruments of your peace and praise. Go with us, we pray. Set some obstacles in front of us, some challenges before us, O oh God, so that as we conquer those obstacles and challenges, we may further your peace and inspire others, uplift others, to be instruments of your peace and your praise. Go with us now as we continue to sing and praise you, as we will soon depart from this place. Grant us your grace and peace, we pray, in the name of Jesus, the one who stilled the waters, quieted the storms, and who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of departure is number 405. Give to the winds thy fears, number 405. It's an ancient story. Most everyone has heard it since they were a child. David and Goliath. David had faith beyond his years, beyond what anyone could have expected of him. And look what God did and accomplished with his faith. How many of the psalms in this book are in tribute to David? A little boy who grew up, nurtured, sustained by his father, Jesse, his brothers, and he grew up to inspire and lead others. So can we. If we have that kind of faith, God grants it. Jesus sustains it and promotes it, and we can all enjoy it today and always. May the blessings of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be abide with you today and always. <laughs>